How are you doing this afternoon? If you are watching it in the afternoon, uh, we are Memphis Community University, and today we are bringing you another AP Calculus free response question practice. Uh, today we are doing um, we are continuing our series of fricks that I call multiple choice like uh, the BC version. So just let me give you a recap of what this video series is about. So um, a lot of free response questions you can categorize. They they sort of repeat a uh, year by year. So for example. Um, differential equation fricks, particle motion fricks, area and volume fricks. Uh, on the BC exam, there's Taylor series fricks, there's polar fricks, there's parametric fricks. So these fricks, I call multiple choice light because they really don't fit in any one of those categories. Basically, uh, the AP exam just uh, takes a few multiple choice questions that are somewhat related and then just shoves it together. So what I call the multiple choice light because they're basically just four multiple choice questions with out multiple choice answers basically uh, and they cover a wide range of topics um, so uh, if you've been watching our channel you'll know that these uh, frick topics come in uh, levels from difficulty one all the way up to difficulty 10 so for example in our Taylor series for response questions we start off pretty standard difficulty one and then we slowly progress our level to difficulty 10 so this video um, of course is going to be difficulty three and uh, these fricks were probably going to be non-calculator as well. But before we get started, I would suggest that you, this is the video series, this free response question is probably the most important one to watch from difficulty one to through difficulty 10, because a lot of these fricks don't build on top of each other, like our, for example, our particle motion free response questions, those build on, uh, on top of each other uh, pretty naturally. Because these questions are very miscellaneous, E, if that's an adjective, or I guess miscellaneous is the adjective. So I guess um, because these questions are miscellaneous, all these free response questions in this video series are going to look quite different from each other. So even if you uh, are pretty good at calculus and you're ready for like difficulty seven things and beyond, it's nice to watch these early difficulties just to make sure you know uh, how to do everything or sort of get an idea of how um, the AP College Board offers their questions because while you can predict certain uh, free response questions, for example, like uh, Taylor series on the BC exam, rate in, rate out has been on the AP exam quite a bit. There is usually a miscellaneous frick or a multiple choice light frick, um, what I call it. And uh, this is this allows you to practice, but that's enough of an intro that was quite a long intro. So let's get going. So this free response difficulty three is going to be um, some shapes of curve stuff and some uh, antiderivatives, as we'll see. So uh, the givens are not too much. It says let f be a function. Um, this is the with a derivative of this. So it's going to be e to the minus x times 2 minus x. And uh, it gives me an initial point. So the initial point is a little bit weird because the x coordinate is ln of 3, but that's still perfectly fine. So uh, why are they giving me this point? It's because we'll eventually do fundamental theorem of calculus. That's that's how you know to do the fundamental theorem of calculus because uh, the usual givens are a derivative and an f value. So for example, in particle motion fricks, um, its velocity is given in an initial condition and you want to find another position. But let's get going. Uh, so the first question looks not too bad. Again, these are BC questions, so keep in mind that um, there will be questions that are solely BC, but if you are an AB student, I highly encourage you to still watch this because the first three topics, the first three sub-questions will be AB level questions that, are, that could be on the AP exam. It's only this last fourth uh, question that will be only BC. So let's get going. So we have, we're, we're doing a pretty simple question, writing an equation of a tangent line at a point so we've done this question uh, quite a bit if you've watched our video series. So tangent lines are a pretty basic topic of derivatives. What you need for them is you need a point and a slope because it's a line, and then you need the uh, derivative because the slope is the derivative when it's a tangent line. So I like to always write out those words. I like to write out point and slope, where slope is uh, f prime of ln of 3. So uh, first off, let's find the point. Well, the point's not too bad because they give it to us. So I'm going to write that out. If they didn't give us the y coordinate of the point, we would plug it into the function, but we don't know the function, which is why they gave us both coordinates. Uh, just keep in mind here that the slope is the derivative, but the given is actually the derivative. So we don't actually have to take a derivative in this case. All we have to do is plug in ln of 3, which is nice. So we're going to get um, e minus ln of 3 times 2 minus ln 
of three. So um, I'm not sure if you know your LN rules, but E to the LN will cancel. And then we're going to be left with uh, three to the minus one. So E to the LN cancels, and then you're still left with the minus one. So it's three to the minus one. And then two minus LN of three. So this is the slope. Um, if you want to, you can write three to the negative one as one third. So it's nice to know these small little um, exponent rules. Sorry, e to the ln of three. Great. So um, with that in mind, uh, we are ready to write the equation of the line because we do have a point and we do have a slope. So let's do that real quick. So this is gonna be the equation of my line. Um, just like normal, I am going to write it in point slope form because that is the most for e that's the easiest form to work with as long as you have a point and a slope, as the name implies. So in point slope form, you do y minus the y coordinate equals this weird slope, which is just a number, but you can't really simplify it anymore. So I'm going to put that there. So this is my slope m. It's the derivative at this point where we didn't have to take the derivative because it was given. And then finally. Um, it's x minus the y, x coordinate. So that is the first one. Uh, it's not too bad. We really didn't even have to do any calculus because uh, the derivative was given to us already. So let's do this next question. It's, it's going to be around the same difficulty. So it's a shapes of curve question. Uh, for what x does f have a local min, which is the same thing as relative min, or local max, which is the same thing as relative max? So this is a shapes of curves question. Uh, the four shapes of curve questions are Incre increasing, decreasing, concave up or down, local min or max, which is this one, and inflection points. If you need to, uh, watch our video series, our video playlist on shapes of curves. I think it's one of our longest uh, playlists because shapes of curves is such a big topic. But for now, uh, what we need to do is we need to draw the sign chart of this uh, derivative right here. So I'm going to rewrite the derivative so that we don't have to keep scrolling up. So the problem here is that we do not have a calculator, so we, do, we cannot rely on a calculator to know what this graph looks like, to see where it goes from negative to positive or positive to negative, but it's still uh, not too bad. Uh, so I need to draw a sign chart of this graph. We do have a sign chart video in that shapes of curves playlist that I alluded, alluded to before. But what I like to do when I do sign charts is I like to factor it of the form x plus or minus something, x plus or minus something, x plus or minus something. For example, I like it when it looks like f prime of x equals x minus 1 times x plus 7. Then I'm ready to draw the sign chart. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to just do a small little algebra step. I want to take the negative outside of this 2 minus x so I can express it as x minus 2. So I get negative e to the minus x over x minus 2. So now I'm ready to draw the sign chart. So uh, keep in mind that sign charts are not exactly graphs. Sign charts just represent the signs of the function on certain intervals. So if you don't know, e to anything is always positive, even e to a negative number, because it's just 1 over e to a, of a positive number. So for example, e is like 2.7. So 2.7 to the negative 2 is 1 over 2.7 to the 2, so it's still positive. So whenever you are ready to draw your sign chart, meaning you've factored as much as possible. If you have an e to the negative x or an e to the x or e to the 2x or something like that, you can actually sort of exit out because it doesn't affect the sign chart at all. It's always a positive number, meaning that when you multiply it by other things in the function, uh, it doesn't change the rest of the function. So if you have a positive number and you multiply it by an e to the minus x, it's going to remain positive because e to the minus x is always positive. Uh, same thing with a negative number. If you have a negative number times e to the minus x, um, you will still remain with a negative number. So in this case, when we're trying to draw the sign chart of f prime of x, it's going to be the sign chart of this thing right here, basically, without the e to the minus x. So the minus is very important. So it's going to be the sign chart of minus x minus 2. But that's simply a line. It goes through the point 2. And because it's a negative slope, because this is the slope, it's going to go like this. And then it's going to be positive and negative. I never plug in points in my interval. I actually draw sign charts uh, according to graphs. But in this case, again, e to the minus x does not affect the sign chart. So once you've drawn this sign chart, now we can do the uh, local min, local max question. Before I do that, let me just do increasing, decreasing, because it's easier. So the, if it, the question was f is increasing, it would be f is increasing 
when f prime is positive, we can just write that down. F is increasing when f prime is positive, uh, which is from the interval negative infinity to 2. So for um, x smaller than 2. Uh, similarly, f is decreasing when f prime is negative for x bigger than 2. But that's not actually the question here. Here we're doing local max or min. So just uh, once you've drawn the sign chart, hopefully you've done this enough where you do know the answer. So f actually has a local max at this point because f prime goes from positive to negative, and that's precisely the rule for local max or min. Again, if you need a review on this, uh, check out our shapes and curves videos. But let's write the answer. f has a local maximum. I like to spell out the word maximum if I'm actually writing the answer at x is equal to 2. And my justification, but the subject of my justification for all of my shapes and curves questions uh, in this sort of format is always f prime. It's never, um, or f double prime. It's never graph or sine chart or it or slope. It's always to be, I'm trying to be always be as specific as possible. That means use f prime or use f double prime, whatever your sine chart is. So f prime goes from positive to negative. There. So that's my justification uh, because f prime, it, the sine chart of f prime looks like this. Once we factored it as much as possible, that's how we were able to determine it. Then we can answer the question f prime, uh, f has a local max at this point because f prime goes from positive to negative at this point. So um, that's the shapes and curves question. We have another one. Um, they are fairly important. So here we have an, uh, on what intervals is the function f of x um, concave down? So let me uh, re remind you a few things about concave down. So the first thing about concave down is um, there's actually two rules for concave down because um, there's a relationship between f and f prime and f double prime. So let me write what the rules down for f concave down is. So f is concave down. The first rule that most people know is f double prime is negative. But f double prime and is negative implies that f prime is decreasing. So actually, I have two rules uh, to choose from in order to best justify and best work this question. f double prime is negative, f prime is decreasing. Um, but when you have these sort of algebra questions, which allows you to take multiple derivatives, you want to be using the f double prime is negative rule because we're about to draw a sign chart, and sign charts only tell where things are in, uh, positive and negative. I don't have any chart that's called the increasing decre decreasing chart, so it's hard to use this rule uh, when the graph of f prime is not already provided. So again, anytime I have multiple choice questions with shapes or curves and I see the words concave up or down or inflection point, I immediately try to find the second derivative. Because oftentimes in these AP exams, uh, you can get multiple points for finding the second derivative correctly. And the actual question like concave down is only worth like a third of the points uh, that are allotted in that section. So you might be wondering, well, when do you use this f prime decreasing rule? You want to use this rule when um, you're provided an f prime graph. So those are um, sort of these graph free response questions that do appear on the AP exam every year. We do have a difficulty one through 10 set on that one as well. But that's when you're really using the f prime decreasing rule. You try to not use it uh, for things you can take multiple derivatives because you're allowed to draw sign charts uh, by yourself. So let's get going. Uh, let me rewrite the derivative on the back so that we don't have to keep flipping over. Um, it's f prime of x equals e to the minus x times 2 minus x. So again, um, this is the derivative. So I see the words concave down, and I think in my mind I need to use the rule f double prime is negative, which means I need to draw a sine chart of f double prime, which means I need to find f double prime immediately. But keep in mind that in this case, because we are already starting with f prime, we just need to take one derivative to find f double prime. So we're going to take one derivative. Um, derivatives, I'm hoping that by the time you watch this video, you are very comfortable with the derivatives. Just be careful to use chain rule and product rule and quotient rule when necessary. So here it's a product rule question. So it's uh, keep the same times the derivative of this one, which is negative 1, uh, plus the derivative of e to the minus x. And be careful, this is not just 
um, e to the minus x. It is e to the minus x times negative 1 because of the chain rule, the derivative of minus x. And then finally, we would keep the last part the same. And we are good to go. Uh, that is the second derivative. I might get points. Uh, if this were a three-point question, I might have gotten already two points or something like that. But, of course, we want all the points because we are greedy. So let's finish the question. In order to tell if whether whether this where is this function concave down, we do need to find where f double prime is negative. This is f double prime, so I'm about to draw a sign chart, but I'm not ready to draw the sign chart yet, uh, simply because I have not factored as much as possible. Remember, the main focus and the main thing you need to remember for sign charts is to factor it as much as possible. So in this case, uh, it looks like I'm able to take out an e to the minus x, a negative e to the minus x. So I'm going to do that real quick. So be careful what remains. Some people forget that this remains, so there'd be a, a 1 here because e to the negative x times 1 would be this term. And then it looks like uh, this would this was factored out, so that we were left with plus 2 minus x. So again, we factored out an e to the minus x, negative 1, and I brought out the negative in the front. Um, it looks like we are still going, so it's negative e to the minus x. We can simplify this, obviously, as 3 minus x. 1 plus 2, of course, is 3. But um, again, if you try to draw this sign chart immediately, you might mess it up because this is not factored as much as possible. Just like in the previous case, we don't like things when it's written as um, something minus x. I like to write them as x minus something and then putting a negative or a positive in the front. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out a final negative. And when I take out this final negative, the negative will cancel out with this negative. So I'm going to be left with this, e to the minus x times x minus 3. And only after all this algebraic manipulation am I ready to draw the sign chart because now I have it as factored as much as possible. Um, the E won't affect the sign chart and I have everything that has X's in the form X plus or minus something, X plus or minus something, X plus or minus something. So on the side here, I am going to draw my sign chart. So hopefully you can see it. It's the sign chart of this guy right here. Again, this E does not affect the sign chart because um, e is always positive. E to, e to anything is always positive. So I'm going to exit out basically, or we can draw like dotted lines through it. So my sign chart is just the line x minus 3, which is a pretty simple line. It goes through the point 3. Um, there's no negative in the front, so the slope is positive. So it looks like this. And now we are ready to answer the question. It's uh, Once you draw the, have drawn the sign chart, hopefully it's pretty easy. F is concave down when f double prime is negative. Well, that is on the interval 0 to 3. So I'm going to write my answer in this little box right here. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that, remember, I think it's explicitly said on the AP exam that sign charts are not given any points, any credit. It's only sentences that justify or explain the sign chart that actually gives you credit. So let's do that. So again, f is concave down on this interval. Where is it negative? It's from negative infinity to 3 because I have to justify, um, and the rule is f double prime is negative. Again, I would use f prime decreasing when I have an f prime graph. So because f double prime is negative, and we can just write the word there. And that's the answer to that one. Again, uh, b and c weren't too bad. Uh, I was just practicing drawing fairly tricky sign charts because they involved e's. So we have one last question. Um, this question is the BC only question. So if you have been in AB, uh, this is your time to um, maybe learn something new. Hopefully, if you choose not, uh, if you choose to continue watching this video, uh, BC only topics. This BC only topic is pretty easy, and it will appear in college if you want to sort of get ahead of start on that. But let's do this question. It says using anti differentiation. That just means simply taking the integral and uh, doing fundamental theorem of calculus. We need to find f of x. So let me remind you of what the givens were uh, here. Uh, we don't need to see the rest of the page here. f prime of x was equal to e to the minus x, 2 minus x. And then we had an initial point. I don't know what just happened. The pen, my cat pen came off. So our initial point was ln of 3 equals 4. Uh, notice we haven't used this point really at all. And again, uh, this is where you use the point. When you're doing fundamental theorem of calculus, um, this is usually the given. So it's uh, the the scenario to use the fundamental of, uh, theorem of calculus is they give you some information about the derivative and they give you an initial point and they want you to find either f or f at a different point. 
So, uh, for example, and um, and rate in rate out fricks, they give you rate in minus rate out, and they give you the initial amount, and they they want you to find the amount at like twenty or something. Uh, same thing with particle motion fricks, they give you velocity, and they want they give you initial position, and they want you to find a new position. Uh, same thing in uh, graph fricks, they give you an f prime graph, and they'll say something like f of two equals three, and they want you to find f of four or something. And to find that integral, you would do area. So. FT, fundamental theorem of calculus is named fundamental for a reason. It does appear in a variety of questions, and uh, basically you're just doing the integral in different ways, either using a calculator. In this case, we're taking an antiderivative. Sometimes you use area. Sometimes you approximate the integral using the sums. Um, we do have a video or several videos on the fundamental theorem of calculus on this channel. But for now, let's do this one question. So again, we have this derivative, this function. Because we're finding f of a x, I'm going to use the plus c way to do this integral, basically meaning that I'm going to plug in this number at the very end of the question as opposed to at the beginning of the question. So let's do that. So I'm going to ignore this number right here, and I'm just going to try to take this antiderivative. So this is probably the hardest part of the question, um, but I believe in us. Let's keep, Let's get going. So um, this is a BC question, and when you're on, on a BC exam, especially in the free response question, you should always be wary that you might have to integrate by two different methods. The first one is integration by parts, which is uh, the opposite of the product rule, so that's what we're going to use in this case. And then secondly, um, integration by partial fractions, that's used with fractions. Um, this is not a fraction, so we're not going to be doing that. Um, so I'm going to work. Uh, I'm going to lead you through this question, integration by parts. Feel free to watch our integration by parts videos and our integration by partial fractions uh, if you need a reminder on how to do some BC level free uh, integrals. So remember that in integration by parts, there's um, basically we're trying to choose two functions. Uh, we set up this little uh, rectangle. We're choosing two functions, u and dv, because we're going to try to change this harder integral into an easier integral using the formula u times v minus the integral of v du. So if we choose good can candidates for u and v and v and du, we are hoping to transform this harder integral that's a product into an integral that hopefully doesn't have a product and we just know it's antiderivative. So again, we're trying to choose u and dv. And how to do that is we use this acronym called LIATE. And what LIATE does is it helps us determine which ones, uh, which of the functions will be u and which of the functions will be dv in this way. So I'm just going to say these, what, these, um, what these letters stand for um, because they don't cover this question, but, um, or some of the letters don't cover this question. But L stands for logarithmic. That's for functions like ln of x. I stands for inverse trig, that's for functions like inverse sine, inverse ten. A is the most confusing one, but it is the most basic one. It stands for algebraic, uh, meaning stuff like x squared plus one, or x, or two minus x, for example, in this case, or even just dx. Uh, T stands for trigonometry, so that's sine and, and cosine and tan and things like that. And then E is exponential, so e to the x, and then other things to the x as opposed to x to those things. So for example, uh, 3 to the x, 5 to the x, pi to the x, those are all um, under the umbrella of this e. And in this case, e to the minus x is also under the umbrella of this e. So remember that in this acronym, if you, if you have something towards the left of the acronym, that's a good candidate for u. And if you have something towards the right of the um, ac acronym, that's a good candidate for dv. So let's do this one last integration by parts question. So um, again, we have two things. We have 2 minus x and e to the minus x. Well, 2 minus x is algebraic. So this is a. e to the minus x is um, exponential. This is e. Notice that a is to the left of e. So it makes sense that 2 minus x is going to be my a. And then my dv is going to be e to the minus x. And then remember your dx. So I have chosen my u and dv. Once you choose your u and dv, just like in u subs when you choose your u, uh, basically the question works itself out. You just need to do the process. So we've done the hard part of choosing. So let's keep going. So uh, once you've chosen these two things, what you do is you take the derivative of u. So that's going to be negative 1 times dx because we bring the dx over like normal. And the trickier part, of course, is taking the integral of dv to form v. 
in this case, uh, just be careful. It is e to the minus x with a negative in front because um, we're taking an antiderivative of minus x. So we're multiplying by the reciprocal of negative one, which is negative. If you wanna watch a video on this, we have a video called Skipping Easy U Substitutions that I made um, in our integration methods playlist. But for now, uh, we're gonna do this integral. So once we've chosen all of these things, we are ready to go. So the first thing is to um, the first thing is to list u and v. So u is equal to two minus x. Uh, v is e to the minus x. I'm going to take out my negative in the front because I like to always take out my constants in the front. And then just be careful here. So let's be uh, let's just do this in uh, multiple steps. So I'm going to replace v with what it is, negative e to the minus x. I'm going to replace du with what it is, negative dx. So notice that in this question, uh, we might run out of room. Hopefully, I'll get another sheet of paper. But notice in this question, there's three negatives. Uh, there's negative, negative, and negative. So when you can't, so these negatives will cancel out. So we'll just be left with a negative, and this negative is from the formula. So this negative is from the v. This negative is from the du, and then this negative is from the formula. And when you have three negatives, you'll end up with one negative uh, at the end, or at the beginning, I guess. So let me grab another sheet of paper. So I'm going to continue doing this. So it's going to be equal to negative 2 minus x. I'm not changing anything. I'm just rewriting things. And then I'm just going to get rid of these negatives because they're kind of pesky and to deal with. So this is the function. So we have done integration by parts. We have achieved our goal. We have come uh, started with a more complicated integral and uh, ended up with an easier integral. We still have to take this antiderivative, of course, but um, we don't have to employ integration by parts. Keep in mind, if you're doing integration by parts at this stage right here, once you get to your easier integral, you might need to do integration by parts again if it's still a product or you might have to do a u-sub. For example, in this case, it's technically a u-sub or, or anything that the integral requires. So this part, you don't change at all. We can write f of x here because this is what f of x is. And then again, the integral of e to the minus x is e to the minus x, but a negative comes out because we're taking, uh, we're multiplying by the reciprocal of the derivative of the inside function, which is minus x. So it's gonna be plus. So th uh, there was a minus and it canceled out with this minus, so it became plus. And then we're gonna remember plus c, that's important. Why is that important? Well, we are, we are going to finally uh, use this point f of ln of three equals four to find that c. So let's do that real quick and then we are done. So um, again, the point is f of ln of three equals four. So I don't think we need to see this anymore. So let's let's go for this second sheet of paper. So again, the last step is to find this plus c using the initial condition to find the specific antiderivative of this um, derivative of f prime. So let's do that. So we're gonna plug in four here. Uh, we're going to plug in ln of 3 into all these x's. So we're going to plus c. Uh, remember from the uh, beginning that the e to the ln of 3 cancels out, and you'll be left with 3 to the negative 1, which is 1 third. So these e to the L negative ln of 3's are just going to be 1 third. Um, and then you have negative, and then we're going to plug in 2 minus ln of 3. So uh, it looks like I can simplify C a little bit, so I'm gonna do that for you guys. So it's gonna be four times um, negative one third, two minus ln of three, again, because e to the minus ln of three is one third, um, plus one third, because again, e to the minus ln of three is one third. Um, let's break up this guy because uh, one of them has an ln and one of them doesn't. So we have four equals minus two thirds. This negative one third will cancel out this negative right here. So it's gonna be plus ln of three over three. And then finally we have a plus one third here. So we are ready for to find C. C is going to be, um, well negative two thirds plus one third is negative one third. We're gonna add it to this side. So that's gonna be four and one third, but we are not bakers. And we're not fifth graders, so we're going to write that as a mixed. Um, uh, at, we're going to write that mixed number as an improper fraction. Four and one third would be, um, I believe, thirteen thirds. 
because four is 12 thirds, so you're um, adding one, so it becomes 13 thirds. And then finally, we're gonna subtract off this guy right here. So we have C, we are not done, but we are almost done. All we're gonna do is replace um, in this formula right here, we can just do an arrow right here. We're just gonna replace the C with this number. So let's just do that real quick and we are done. So f of x equals all of this stuff rewritten. Let me try to conserve space. And then instead of plus C, we're gonna write plus th 13 thirds. It's a little bit weird of a C of course, but this is what they gave us. So ln of three, hopefully you can tell that this is just 13 thirds minus the ln of three at this very end. Probably should have made a bigger box, but what are you gonna do? And we are done with this free response question. So let me, as usual, rec recap exactly what we did. So for the first question, um, it was just equation of the tangent line that just requires point and a slope. And because the slope was derivative, it was easy to find. The next two questions were shapes of curves questions, which requires knowing the rules. Local min or max requires where f prime goes from positive for max and f prime goes from negative to positive for min. So what we did is uh, we just listed the derivative as they gave us, but we factored it as much as possible, drew its sign chart, and noticed that this was a max because it went from positive to negative, and we justified. Concave down was a little bit trickier because we did have to take a derivative, and after we took the derivative, it did require a few algebra steps to factor as much as possible, but we are factoring as much as possible in order to make the sign chart as easy to draw, and the sign chart ended up being this line because ease uh, to function the exponentials do not affect sign charts. So we noticed that uh, f is concave down when f double prime is negative, which is uh, from negative infinity to three. Finally, uh, we had a integration by parts. So we used the yate to determine um, what goes where. So this u and this dv, like normal, we take the derivative of u, take the integral of dv, then we form this function, this uh, rule, u times v minus the integral of v du. So it's u times v, minus the integral of v du. We were careful with negatives, and we were careful with antiderivatives. And once we found the plus c, we plugged in our initial point, which was a little bit tricky, actually, because we needed to know a little bit of e knowledge and ln knowledge. But we found our c, and then at the very end, very messily, we uh, wrote the final answer by replacing the c with that number. So I hope that you got something out of this. It was a good review of both shapes of curves and integration by parts. And integration by parts is basically a 50% chance to be on the AP exam in a significant way uh, because the other 50% is partial fractions. So, for example, in this question, if this integration by parts was on this, it might be worth 4 out of 9 points, which could be the difference between a 3 and a 4 and a 4 and a 5, for example. So I'm hoping you got something out of this. I, I do encourage you again to continue... Um, to continue watching these videos as we go through difficulty one all the way up to difficulty 10 so that you can sort of see some of the trick questions that might be appear on the AP exam or uh, get a nice review over several, several different topics um, in order to make sure that you know those sub, uh, topics. But I certainly had fun. I like these questions because I like taking integration by parts. I like drawing side charts and things like that. So I hope to see you in the next video, Difficulty 4, and I promise you we will have as much fun. Thank you very much.